I was never a process guy. Like when guys are like, oh yeah, I'm all about the process. That was never me. I'm like, I don't give a shit what the process is. Like I want the light at the end of the tunnel previously. And now I fully love the process of it. So a lot of those mistakes, I'm like, man, was it a mistake? I don't know. Cause now I've learned the lesson. And that's been one of my thoughts with the failed companies because I've had a couple other failed companies as well. The lessons learned were ingrained so much more than the lessons learned when it went well, if that makes sense. So for me, a lot of times I'm like, well, I, I like went ugly early. I gave away equity like it was candy. I took in, you know, took on debt. And so my point is I've come to love that process of learning so much, which is funny because I hated school but I love learning through business so much that I don't view those necessarily as mistakes at this point. Um, I'm kind of like glad they happened to like get them out of the way, right? Like get that done in the twenties that way in your thirties, forties, et cetera, you can, you know, hit the ground running, so to speak. You're listening to the born primitive podcast. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the Born Primitive Podcast. Morning, Tony. Morning, Bert. How we doing today? Doing good. We got an 80 degree day coming today. So first I got the Hawaiian shirt on, <laughs> broke it out for the first time. I'm ready. Just hit the cold tubs. Yeah. We're feeling good. All right, everybody. So today uh, we got a, a, a in-person guest, uh, Brent Phillips. Uh, Brent was a recon Marine, did uh, just under 10 years in the service. Uh, and then is the founder of a company called Softly. Uh, a lot of you probably heard of it, but we'll, we will get into the origin story of that. Um, he's also the chief marketing officer over at PSC Archery. So um, a man of many talents. Uh, welcome to the, the studio, man. Uh, yeah. Glad to have you. Thanks for the intro. It's good to be here. First first time here at Born Primitive. So. And you came up from North Carolina, right? Yeah, I'm in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Well, you know, I want to get into the definitely the, the founding story of Softly. But before that, you know, obviously the military angle, being a recon Marine, Walk us through quick, you know, um, you know, your upbringing and then, you know, what made you motivated to join the service and then why, why recon Marine? Okay. Yeah. So my, uh, growing up, I, it kind of matters cause there's a, I like the juxtaposition between your athleticism in, in your youth versus mine. So I was more into like BMX surfing, skating, not a great scholastic athlete. I played lacrosse and soccer, but wasn't like super high performer or anything. You know, I was always made the teams, but was not the all-star by any measure. And then I was in like community college, working at a BMW dealership, kind of not really a great life plan and got hurt riding a dirt bike and was kind of like laid up on the couch for a day, just licking my wounds. and was like, what the hell am I doing with my life? Grabbed a book uh, about like current, you know, conflicts and was like, I'm going to go do something like this. This seems really cool. And so and around what year was this? That would have been 2007. Okay. All right. Yeah. So in the thick of things. Yeah. It was out. like right in the middle of, or in the early GWAT. I thought yeah. it was the middle of the GWAT yeah. at the time, but it was early GWAT and walked into all, I kind of figured like, I want to go into a special unit for some reason I was like drawn towards that. So I walked into an army and all of the recruiters were very quintessential, like what you would think they were, you know? So like army recruiter was like kind of fat like yeah sure like fill this packet out try to go to sf <laughs> this the seal recruiter is like you ain't gonna make it don't even try yeah. i was like well this guy's a dickhead and then uh, yeah, i always the, thought that was interesting the, yeah. the guy told me the same thing i'm like and you're he wasn't even a seal i'm like how are you are you telling me that yeah <laughs> and i was like your job is to like get me in and i had a family friend that had been a recon marine in like the 80s and 90s and so I kind of had that in the back of my head anyway. And the Marine recruiter was like, oh, you want to go recon? That's a, that's super hard. You probably won't make it, but it'd be badass to try. He was like positive. Probably super squared away uniform. Yeah, yeah like yeah. he looked like a Marine. Yeah. And I was like, well, this dude actually like gives a shit. And so can I cuss on my podcast? Yeah, of yeah. course. Oh, yeah. Cool. Let it rip. yeah, so I was like, this dude gives a shit. I'll do that. And so I, I went in and uh, did recon, went to MARSOC and did MARSOC and had a phenomenal experience. I probably would have never stopped had I not start a business that was doing really well and you know got out basically just to do that and uh still wanted to stay tied so i did the contracting thing and you know worked quite a bit with the dod and um different mostly soft units and so kind of stayed tied to it and then uh you know just went full bore into business in reality with soft fleet and so that's kind of the down and dirty origin story yeah. there 
And when you go into the Marines, when you want to be recon and MARSOC, can you get like a contract before you, you enlist? Because that's how it works in like the team, SEAL teams. Like you can get a BUDS contract before yeah. you sign. So you can um, for recon, okay. but then you have to be in for, I think, three or four years before you go to MARSOC. Okay. So I did a deployment to Afghanistan with recon, got back, switched battalions, and then applied to MARSOC to go to selection. And all okay. That. So And how's that selection? Is it a ball buster? Uh, it is, but it it's all, I'd already gone through recon school. So I'd already had my balls adequately busted at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it, it was what I think a lot of people are not prepared for is we always look at, especially from a coach's perspective is the physicality of the events. And that's really not what they're selecting for. That's definitely a need, but they're selecting for, can you go do land navigation by yourself for a week, two weeks, three weeks? Can you do these other things. And when you break those down, it's really, can you be taught something and then apply it at a high level quickly? Yep. And so for me, knowing that I already had the physicality from being at recon and I knew the skills. And so now it was like, well, can I just go do land navigation for a couple of weeks by myself? Yep. I can do that. Can I go do, you know, team week, which is working in a small team to accomplish weird tasks. Yep. I can do that. I've already done it. And so it was a ball buster. I'm not downplaying it by any means, but my life and military experience at that point made it less of a ball buster than, you know, I went straight in from high school. Nice. Like, I think physically the MARSOC pipeline was at least as challenging as the recon one. But since I did the recon one as an 18 year old kid with no experience in any of that, that was way harder. For oh, yeah. Me. Yeah. So, nice, man. Yeah. And when you guys do the land nav, are, are you guys like uh obviously it's just you know map and compass yeah type shit. oh yeah and yep. maybe eventually you get gps but i'm guessing no, all, you, it's all no, map and compass it's all map and compass. association and everything yeah yeah that's a that's a mind game man because when you're yep. when you're land navving and you haven't gotten to that point yet um yep you question like I, okay i think i i'm here but like I'm there. where's the point you <laughs> yeah. know what i mean and you, yeah. you get to that last like hundred yard box where you're like all right i'm, I'm so they here. had vans actually oh okay. so it made it but your your legs were so far apart okay. but you're looking, right. for you're looking for a white van but okay. i've done the recon land now of course was like dog tags yeah. on a green on a, stake exactly that's what we had yeah. you know, sometimes you could hear them in the wind uh if, if it was windy oh you, you'd be like all right i hear it it's, yeah, I'm, I'm with it <laughs> you know what i mean but you'd be walking you'd yeah. be boxing it out and you'd be like what the fuck is this thing? Yeah. Uh, and then you'd find it and celebrate and eat some uh, expired sour Skittles from your MRE. Yeah. And uh, go find the next one. Yeah. My, <laughs> you could go on a crazy tangent for hours on like selection and land nav stories. But one of the funniest things to me when I was in recon school doing uh, land nav, I came up on this group of guys just outside of where you, you would come back to where the, all the cadre were. And like, I don't know, three, it was a long time ago, three to 10 of these guys, I don't remember how many it were, were just asleep on the side of this hill together, like lined up. And you're not allowed to talk to anybody or engage with anybody in those land nav courses. It's like, what the hell are you guys doing? They're like, dude, we already got three out of the five points. That's passing. Yes. We're sleeping. Oh, no. And, and I was caught. like, uh, some of them got caught. I was like, man, I am not like far enough ahead in any of the things that we're doing to feel that I can do that. So I was just like busting my ass to hit all my points. It's like, I always thought they were watching. And then it's funny being on the other side because I've been a selection instructor twice now. And you're like, dude, those guys were literally just like sitting in lawn chairs bullshitting the whole time. They were gone. <laughs> yeah. They were not looking oh, for no, us. Not like, at all. Didn't no. give a shit. No, they're know? not coming out to find you. Nope. Super funny. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's a good time. We, we had a guy that he got, he, you got to get five out of seven. And he got his first five, like in the first like four hours. Yeah. And you're supposed to like call extract and you got a radio and you call it in the whole thing. And then you like, you hide, you know, they come get you in a van and shit. Yeah. Well, he called an extract immediately when he got his fifth point. Yeah. And it's like, so dude, did. you have all day. So they got, he got back. So he like turned in his points. Like, where's the other two? He's like, I got five. I passed. And they're like, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Like you have until four, you know, 1600 or something. So yeah. they failed. And we're like, dude, oh, really? you're fucking idiot. Like go sit on a boulder yeah. for five hours yeah. and enjoy the, the silence and the, you know, not getting messed with. So he, yep. they made him retake it the next day and he almost failed it. That was the last attempt, but he got it. He, yeah. he barely got it. I thought you were going to say like, he just did push ups for seven no, no. hours. He literally, <laughs> he literally called an extract immediately. Uh, um, when the rest of us, we were all hanging around, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, having a good time. And yep. so, yeah, it's funny man but that's it's a good time but all right so you did you did the recon thing um did some deployments you know yeah mid -G -Watt. Did, yep yeah. 
did okay. that. Then went to Marsoc. And then when I was at Marsoc, I started a gym next to the base. Okay. I didn't want to work out on base. And uh, so I was like, there's no CrossFit gyms around here. I'm going to start a CrossFit gym. And um, that ended up becoming kind of softly by happenstance and accident. So, okay. Um, and, and you were talking that, you know, guys were doing some programs that there was a kind of a high injury rate and you thought you could tailor it more to the job. Obviously you were, you were the, you know, doing the job as well. So you kind of had a good idea. Where did you get kind of that basis of knowledge to kind of know how to develop programming, particularly with your background? You know, you kind of said it wasn't this, um, you weren't, you don't come from this, you know, yeah. Well, so all American, you know, whatever. Yeah. Know. Wasn't a, a, a college football player at Yale, you know, which is, <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. We were the opposites then when we came in. Uh, so that actually kind of played to a strength where I had to learn how to get fit very quickly because the guys in those special units, they're not typically on a, and, and not to say I was unathletic, but I was not scholastically like a stud, wasn't a cross country runner, et cetera. You know, I had a base level. I didn't know that surfing would be probably the best thing going into that was like water confidence. So I had to learn, okay, how do you get fit? Like by the numbers, doing 20 pull-ups, doing all of these things that were kind of hard gates that I had to hit. And so I just started researching, I had a laptop, had the internet and I started researching. And then after researching, I went and did, I don't even remember in 2000. 10, I did some long online personal training certification and went and got a job as a personal trainer in Orange County, uh, in San Clemente at a gym training, like the real, real housewives of OC types, you know, <laughs> like it was the worst job I've ever had. I did it for like a year. I absolutely hated it. Uh, I would rather do any other job on the planet basically than that. It doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> yeah. It, it was <laughs> not fun or glamorous at all. Uh, it was terrible, but so that's, that started my education and, and it, I didn't have a great education. I kind of, as far as fitness goes to say like, oh, I did this course at this place. I did the smattering CrossFit courses. I did some uh, weightlifting courses for like technique in Olympic weightlifting and then opened up the gym and then continued that education, but really just collecting information from the various sources that are out there now, right? So like John Wellborn at Power Athlete became a good friend of mine. And we would talk shop about strength and conditioning all the time. And so instead of having like, you know, the NSCA and and be like, hey, this is exactly the way that we're going to do tactical strength and conditioning. We started the other coaches and I in that gym and in Softly started to create our own methodology. And so we started to write internal courses. And a lot of those guys like had degrees in sports psychology and various smatterings of like typical education. And mine was like collecting these courses between deployments and schools and all of these things where it's like, okay, cool. I can knock out this course or that course. And so I can't point to like one piece of education that brought it all together, but I also had the user perspective. And so when it came together, I would lean on the team of coaches and people and be like, Hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking, which I'm sure you've done as an entrepreneur. And that's how it all came together. So, and it was at no point supposed to be like, this is Brent's methodology. Like that wasn't even a thought. It was how do we bring this together as a collective and then test it. So everything that we were doing in the early days, we would run. Luckily, I was still in the team so I could run those guys through the tests Mm -hmm. and be like, hey, we're going to test these programs and see what pops out on the other side. And what what did those initial kind of like give me? Because it sounds like you got exposed to a ton of different systems of training, whether it's CrossFit, even I'm sure like Conjugate. um, I'm sure Wellborn was uh, exposed you to that. What did that initial kind of programming, what would you say the flavor of it was? Like what, if you had to call out a few, like what did that look like? So it was a little different because we had, by the time we got to Softleet, I already owned a gym for years, three years at that point. And so it was next to Camp Lejeune. We had a ton of military clients. We had at one point, I want to say the most amputee members outside of CrossFit Balboa that we were working with. So we had close relationships with CrossFit Balboa and all these other places that were working with amputees. And so the, the first wasn't so much of, Hey, this is the first plan that really matters. It was, it started at taking what we had written on the whiteboard for everybody and then tailoring that to two different guys that are both below the knee, right leg amputees with totally other like circumstances that required them to have different movement sets. And that's where the real education came in was going, okay, 
we've got back squats programmed, but you can't do that because you've got a below the knee amputation, but you can with your below the knee amputation mm -hmm. and then starting to pick apart the, why can this dude do it? And this guy can't. And so I guess the, the first programs that Softly had were actually a, a collection of all of that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so we took the parts and pieces that were most important to success for the job. And then we tried to strip away the things that could inhibit that, if that makes sense. So if we talk about a strong posterior chain, you're going to put on a 60 pound plus ruck or kit or whatever and move really fast for a short period of distance or really far, you need a strong posterior chain. You're not going to have anybody argue with that mm -hmm. ever. And so one of the studies that we looked at for that particular problem set was uh, Canadian soft did a study and they equated their highest performing, the highest two performing metrics that they saw candidates got selected or had when they got selected was a, a heavy back squat, one rep max, it might have been a three rep max, okay. but a heavy back squat okay. and a high VO2 max. Okay. So you can affirm from that you had a strong posterior chain and you had a good aerobic base. Nice. Like if we really distill that down. Yeah, right? That makes sense. It makes so total then sense. you look at it and there's a million ways to get a strong posterior chain. You could, and how, what's the safest least technical way to do that because there's great ways to do it that are very technical but when you're taking a guy like you had a background in strength and conditioning coming into the teams i did not i had to learn how to back squat when i was already a recon marine i didn't know what a back squat was in the gym in high school and there's a lot of quote unquote tactical athletes that are that did you find though really and sorry to cut you off did yeah. you find though because i used to work in, in a similar space in the performance space yep. I've found that sometimes people who weren't athletes growing up and weren't like high level high score collegiate athletes actually move way more efficient than the ones that were athletes because a lot of football, maybe a little less, but baseball was the sport I played. Okay. You build a lot of comp, com, compensatory patterns that kind of can, can twist your hips, can do that. And then you go to get them to do an ass to ass to grass squat. It's literally not possible for their body. So yeah. did you find that you actually, although you learned late that you had an, an efficiency in movement because you hadn't done I, all these different like athletic movements. So I did. And, and it, I didn't dissect it like this literally until yesterday. So before a podcast, I have our coaches prepare some notes for me mm -hmm. as talking points. And one of the, my big talking points was just that juxtaposition between you and I having similar military careers with vastly different pre-military lives. And what they broke down, um, I, I like to think, and my peer group will reflect, I, I was very good at the job on an individual and team level. And the way that my coach Matt broke that down was that surfing, BMX, skateboarding, all of these things, I may not have been working on the strength and conditioning piece, but I was working on the balance piece to mm -hmm. your point. So when it comes to things like CQB, moving through a shoot house, like battle space awareness, the other pieces of the job that are a bit more nebulous than a back squat, that part became easy. And I did pick up some of the movements very quickly because I was doing athletic things. They just weren't the same athletic things that I shifted to. So to your point, yeah. yes, but I will say having injuries from childhood, stupid sports played a huge factor and continues to, as I go, like I race dirt bikes off road now. So they did like Baja 500 this last year. Oh, nice. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Destroyed my back. I've got I'm sure two, you did. two compressed discs in my yeah. lower back that I had previously rehabbed and then did it again. Um, but that is very common, especially as guys are older in their soft careers where it's like you burned in on a jump and now you've got two compressed discs, et cetera. But to your point, yes, overuse injuries and there's a ton of people like you can't overtrain like well you can overuse something for sure um are arguably uh, more detrimental to the high performing communities than underuse if sure. that makes sense and so like being in baseball you have terrible Doing overuse everything one way all in one way hips. crazy imbalances which we see in soft but usually that's in a plane of motion yeah or, or in the military right it's guys move front to back a ton. They're not turning. They're not traversing, going side to side. And so now you see all these overuse injuries from only going one direction. And when soft units started stealing like collegiate and NFL strength and conditioning coaches, that was one of the first things they identified. It's like, yeah, you guys are have back pain because you're literally only going in one direction, yep, basically one plane forward, you know? So you had the CrossFit gym, yep. guys were starting to trickle over and you kind of realized you, you started piecing together some different methodologies. So yeah. 
um, you know, I think a lot of the listeners like the entrepreneurial story. So, so walk us through how you know, you started Soft Lead, and then like, what were some of the early challenges you faced, the early fuck ups? I think some yeah. of those those are the best best lessons learned is like when you don't even know what you're doing yet. Um, yeah, you make every mistake. I, well, um, so I always think yeah. I've made every mistake, yeah. and then I find new ones. <laughs> no, to I make. know yeah. Yeah, that's that'll that's never ending, dude. Yeah, oh, we're still doing that, of course. Yeah. So walk us through the, those okay. early days, and when. Get it to the point where you were like, okay, I actually think this could be a, a substantial business. Like I'm onto something here. Yeah. Maybe that was immediately, um, but yeah, it, walk us through it. It was, then it wasn't. And so Softly was born. So we had this CrossFit gym. We we're CrossFit affiliated, but we did Strongman. We had tons of other programs that we were doing. And guys at Marsoc that I was friends with kept getting injured doing other programs. And not even like the coaches programs at the unit. They're just doing whatever they want because you have that freedom in yep. those units. Mm -hmm. And I would try to get them to do our programs. And they're like, dude, I'm not doing CrossFit. I'm not going to write you CrossFit. So a friend of mine was like, why don't you start a sub company? Call it like soft lead or something and write programs for military guys. I was like, okay, cool. So we wrote two programs, a strength program and a stamina program. And then we quickly followed that with a selection prep program. Um, Cause there's a ton of ask for that. That's like one of the number one things mm -hmm. you always get asked for. We wrote that. I did a built a website in my grandmother's basement on Christmas leave and uh, launched it January 1st. And um, the day that it launched or the night that it launched, it did more business in that night than my gym was doing in a month. And so it was kind of like a, oh, wow, this is. So that was the moment. Yeah, that said, was. Oh, shit. Yeah, I, I literally said, oh, shit, and <laughs> couldn't believe it. And it was selling PDFs. And so I also. I don't know why I always think this, but uh, there's a phrase in my family, this too shall pass. And I say it when things are good and I say it when things are bad. But I think it's really important to say it when things are good too. Like mm -hmm. when it's really good and you're like on top of the world, just remember that's going to go away at some point too. And it's going to, you know, may not go back to the worst ever, but you're not going to be on top of the world forever. It's like anyway. keep, keeping it even keel, right? Yeah, exactly. So we started selling PDFs and business went up like gangbusters and then down like gangbusters. But our engagement in the social media world was through the roof. So and what year was this? That would have been 2015. Okay. So we launched January 1st, 2015, which seems to us probably like yesterday, but it was like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Basically, this is our 10th year in business, which is kind of a cool thing to say. Um, especially in like the fitness technology space where things are usually like a flash in the pan. Yeah. But so guys started giving away PDFs and we're like, that's a bad move. So we moved to a third party training app and we were doing really well with that. And it got to a point where the checks we were writing to pay for that app every month, we figured we could do our own thing and basically retain customer data better. So instead of pushing people to another website where we had no idea what happens, we could just add them on our website and go through that way. And so that was frankly, a bit of a business decision more than like, we really want our own app because developing an app is really expensive. It was much more expensive than we thought, much more challenging, took a lot longer. And and did you bring on an investor at that point or did you do that through just self, like we self We kind of did. So early in the company, we had a, f a friend of mine at the time basically was like, hey, he was like a Wall Street guy and he's like, you're going to need business help. And I was like, well, what business help? Like, I own a business already. I can balance a checkbook. He's like, it's going to get more complicated than that. Uh, for anybody listening, it does not get more complicated than a checkbook. Basically ever. <laughs> like, the numbers have to math. So uh, anyway, we had him. And he, to his credit, really pushed us to build our own app. He was like, you have to scale this business aggressively. And I was, I knew that I needed mentors in business because I was, you know, a dumb Marine at that point. I had no clue what I was doing as far as trying to actually scale. I probably didn't know what scale meant at the time. And so, uh, I, I didn't know what scale meant. I, <laughs> uh, I, I had a clothing company as well that failed. It was a made in USA flannel company. Okay. I left that off right on. Sheet. It went for like two years cause we were like making stuff in the U S sucks. And yeah, uh, yeah, I know doing it 10 years ago sucked even more. Yes. It's gotten a little better lately, but, um, so I'd learned some really hard lessons from losing a boatload of money in a failed <laughs> clothing company already. Well, anyway, I had a, I had a failed business right before born primitive too. So I, I think it. that's part of the journey, man. Yeah. You we gotta be willing to play a lot of hands. So we, after, and I, I want to go down this rabbit hole cause you guys said you wanted to hit the entrepreneurial stuff, but we, after action of that failure mercilessly, like, 
we sat down we're like, why did we fail? And we went through the math, the market position, the marketing, everything that we were doing, the supply chain, all of it and said, why did we fail? And then literally based on those failures, that's what I wrote the business plan for Softly based on. So it, like it was, Softly is infinitely scalable, which is great. Your customer acquisition cost is through the roof, yes. but um, a made in USA flannel company is not infinitely scalable. It is very capital intensive. It is a very challenging business to run. So hats off to anybody that's doing that. And I hope they're doing well with it, but it is very hard. Yeah. What were some of your biggest takeaways as you sat down and kind of did a, a scope on what, what had went wrong versus what you then integrated into softly? What were some of the big, bigger my, takeaways? You my remember? favorite takeaway was that aside from the business lessons of scalability and all that, is that you cannot be everything to everybody and you are who you are. So one of the things as we tried to grow is like we started to peel back some of the like specifically gun culture things that we were doing, not because we became anti-gun, but because we were getting throttled by algorithms. And we're like, okay, well, we're going to open up our customer base. We're going to quit doing, you know, AR-15 photo shoots. <clears throat> and we, that company kind of lost its identity and went into a direction that I did not want, that I have fought like mercilessly and softly to be like, no, we are a tactical fitness company until every guy in the military and every cop is doing softly. We have market share that we can gain mm -hmm. there. That is who we are. If yeah. we're going to do something else, that's a whole other company, but we're not watering down our brand. Like we're, and we're very apologetic about that. We don't touch any politics. And the reason we don't touch politics is because I served under both Democrat and Republican presidents and you work for who you work for in all government service. So yeah, we just, that's commander in chief. Yeah. It's yeah. like, we just don't touch that. We don't touch politics. <clears throat> we believe in gun rights and we can do that, but also we have a tactical demographic and they've got to shoot guns. Like you find the craziest left-wing person on the planet and say, should the military have guns? Unless they're actually crazy, they're going to say yes. Right. So um, anyway, that was the lesson learned was that you are who you are. And if you try to be all things to everybody, you're nothing. And so that was my biggest takeaway is like just define who you are, what you do and stick to that. That's a great lesson. Yeah. And for anyone looking to start a business, I would say write that down, put it on a post-it note because that's so true. hundred percent. We, we've had to, you know, we've, we've had to do the same thing. Um, yeah. And it's like uh, there's the tendency to try to speak to everyone. And by trying to speak to everyone, you're actually speaking to no one because exactly. you're just, you're just going to get, it's a crowded space. No one's going to notice you. Um, you yeah. got to be different and you got to be right. And yeah. If you do those two things, you'll, you'll be onto something good. Yeah, and if you're if you're not different and you're not right, then you're you shouldn't succeed anyway, right? Yeah. Otherwise, you would just be doing the status quo, and you would, yeah. So, okay, so failed business, failed love, business, love that launched softly and started our own app. So we started our own app, was going exceptionally well, and we decided that we wanted to have supporting product lines, like a sleep aid, protein, pre workout, some apparel. Because we actually, I was. After having the failed apparel company, I was adamantly against apparel. We weren't even going to sell t-shirts with a Softleet logo. And then customers were making their own. But like, if you guys don't make t-shirts, we're making <laughs> that's, where, that's when you know. That's, that's, good, you know. that's a good that sign of like, good uh, brand strength. Yeah, yeah it was. Awesome. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, well, we've got to make t-shirts. Because I hate it. Like, I didn't want to be the guy that's like, I'm going to start a t-shirt company. Not a knock. Like, your business is your business. I just didn't want to do that. Probably because of PTSD from the failed, you know, apparel company. And so... We started these supporting product lines, but really it was always about the training plans, um, the nutrition plans. We had a dry fire plan in the app, or still do, um, to help guys with firearms training. And it was about not the things, but the people and making them as capable physically as we could, more so than the other products. And so we had them because it's cool and it's fun. And now I have a blast. Like we just did a run of knives with a friend's knife company and we're doing like wallet and now it's become fun to do products, but for a long time, I was so like militantly focused on all we do is training plans that we, I basically pushed everything else to the wayside. Well, it's, I mean, that's not a bad thing. And, you know, for, for any of the listeners, I think one of the things a lot of people don't realize is when you sell a product vice a service, you have to have inventory, yes. right? And in, in a way you're all, always kicking the can down the road because let's say you have a great business year and you make a bunch of money. Well, guess what guys? we have to use that money to buy next year's product, right? And you pay taxes and on you, that and product. You pay, well, yes, and you, yeah. you can't write off the goods, the, the cost of the goods until you sell it. So Correct. let's say 2023, you kill it, you know, make a bunch of money, but then you use 90% of that cash for the next inventory order. 
Um, well, Uncle Sam does not allow you to write off that 90% because you haven't sold it yet. So no. Uncle Sam taxes you as if you never made that inventory purchase. Yep. Right. And then you owe a bunch of money every quarter, which is an outrageous amount of money. Uh, and then you're like, where did it, where did everything go? So yep. I, I always like kind of chuckle myself. Like if I ever do this again, I'm going to do a freaking service and not a freaking product, particularly apparel. It's crazy, man. It's probably what 20 uh, cents to get, you know what I mean? To get somebody in your ecosystem, it's an extra 20 cents or 30 cents or not, no, not even. It's more than that. Is it? Oh yeah. I don't mean acquisition costs. I just mean like you can scale that infrastructure without having to like, oh, yeah. you know what I mean? Infrastructure is effectively infinitely yeah, scalable. Exa exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. why software companies yeah. are so appealing yes. and you get such big multiples um, yeah. when they, you know, when investors come in. Um, but, uh, so yeah, it's like, man, I, I laugh at that. It's like, we are literally just perpetually kicking the can down the road. You know, if, if, if Mal and I were to ever want to end born primitive, that would be the time we'd actually make the most money because sure. you wouldn't well, have to do that final reorder. For those of you that watch Shark Tank, that's why they're always laughing <laughs> yeah. about that. When they talk about inventory, yeah. they're like, especially Damon who did FUBU, he's like, God, I re like lost my mind because especially you, realize when you try to scale and you're in that, like, um, What's the word I'm looking for here? That that meteoric scale yeah. where you're growing 50% in a year in the early we grew, days. We grew 100% every year Five. for the first eight years. Yep. So we were fun. Like all of the money was funding the next year's growth. Now, obviously, so we, we how didn't did wanna... you do that? Like, well, can I ask that? I mean, is it confidential? Um, no, not confidential at all. Yeah. I mean, the first five and a half years, it was just out of the garage in the house. But we just went okay. to every crossfit event we possibly could um you know we we'd take a booth and just sell shit from you know from from the booth i mean it really that was the, pretty much the marketing plan but how did you capitalize was it like you passed the hat friends and family did you have investors did you do it all like what was the we bootstrapped the whole thing um awesome. i got 10 grand from my brother in the very beginning which was a really dumb move in hindsight <laughs> Um, Are you tell still him, friends tell, with your tell, brother? Tell him that story. Well, yeah, even he, though he was on Wall it. Street, right, <laughs> doing well, he yep. was a Yale football guy, and he went. He did the Wall Street route. A lot of a lot of the Ivy he League athletes. Smarter brother. Yeah, he's probably yeah. smarter than me, but I think I can take him. So that's all that matters at this point. He doesn't. He's, want to he's weirdly athletic. He he's doesn't sneaky. want to scrap at Thanksgiving anymore. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, but you know, he's my size. He's he's. We're about the same build, but he just isn't in the gym as much as he used to. But he's still doing. So he's doing the Wall Street thing. I'm just out of college, uh, really don't have any money. I think I think I had like 3,700 bucks in the bank. And, um, you know, I said, hey, I, I basically had quantified the cost I needed to start like a super shitty little website in my first order of 200 units. Okay. Um, and uh, I realized I, I needed about like 10 grand. So I, I, you know, I called him up. He's a big fancy Wall Street boy now. You know what I mean? I said, hey, I need 10 grand. Like I'm your brother. Yeah. And, uh, and he, he said, well, how much money you got in the bank? And I told him, he's like, all right, well, I'm making you put two grand in just so you have skin in the game. And I was like, ooh, yeah. like. Yeah, that's that's dangerous, but all right. So I put in two, he put in ten. Um, thirty one was our number uh for football. Um, so that was the super complicated way we came up with the equity breakdown. He got thirty one percent for ten grand because that's what Dude, two, I love that's how two meatheads figure out equity. I love the stupidity yeah. of that because I have a very similar story. And um yeah, so that was just the initial, just to get. So I, I guess technically we took on money, but not like you know, um, by an institution. Now and, was this this was in Born Primitive? Yeah, this was Born okay, Primitive. Cool. Well, technically, uh, that the the first company, believe it or not, was actually Snatch Shorts LLC. Um, that was the first product. It was a compression short with a pad um, over the, like the the front, so when you yeah. like, drill your pubic bone with this and the snatch, like it protects yeah. it. And then we realized, okay, this you can't build a brand. This is a, like this is a product name. Yeah. Um, so do we, you guys still sell the snatch? Yeah, yeah we That's do. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. We still it. have. I actually saw Frankie mocked up because our tenure is actually coming up too. Um, When's your tenure? It's actually it's actually this that, month. Yeah. Honestly, That's awesome. Um, um, but uh, our original logo was a caveman snatching a tree with a loincloth between his legs and American flag bandana. Oh yeah, there it is. Right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've been yeah. looking at That's it. Yeah. Original, That's the original logo. Yeah. Once again, that was me. Uh, you know, with the, with the creative vision, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that's terrible. Look at that font. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so that's how it started. And then, um, we just bootstrap. And I went to OCS like two months after that. Um, so just, you, yeah. you did, you started born Perno before the Navy. Yeah. Yeah. A couple months before. Interesting. Yeah. No. How, was that well received when you got to the teams or did you keep it hush hush or what? It was fine. Was it? it was still pretty small and I never like, I never let that other job bleed into, you know, I always sure. like, you know, um, you know, I had opportunities to go on podcasts and stuff and I would always decline them because yeah. out of respect for like my other job. And yeah. I knew that's what they would want to talk about. Not like the, the, the business. Yeah. They would want to talk about that other thing. Yeah. And that would have been, um, you know, a huge violation of just the ethos. And yeah. Um, the, so, uh, yeah. Rob, o I think it was Rob O'Neill's bin Laden book came out like the month before I launched softly. So like the guys in my team didn't know 
that I launched softly. It was like super secret. Okay. Cause the, the, everybody in SOCOM at that point was like, if you come out and say you're a soft guy for monetary gain, they're like, put out a letter. Basically. We're going to nail your dick to the wall. Exactly. I was like, yeah. I am not putting my name anywhere on this company. Yeah. It was, yeah. I would just, you had to disclose it every time you got a new uh, skipper, you just like fill out this yeah. form and admin. It wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Like, they just want to make sure guys aren't leveraging the job to like, for sure. Have conflict of interest deals yeah. with any company, right? That, you know, they don't want guys like a couple of our guys got hemmed up for like consulting for Call of Duty. Yeah, I remember really? that. Really? Big trouble. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. You know what I mean? So like, and it was like, it was like for like 10 grand, you know what I mean? It should, it should have charged them like 500 grand, but they were like, yeah, yeah I'll take 10 grand. For yeah. Like, and they showed them. Huge money when yeah, you're exa- in E6 exactly. or whatever. So um, yeah, navigated that. Okay. And, and obviously it, it becomes a gray area. Um, you know, when you get out to even, cause you know, I think guys have a perception of entrepreneurs coming out of the soft community yeah. and it's this, like, you can kind of get put into a bucket of maybe guys you that can. have taken it way too far. Yep. Um, particularly when guys, you know, when, when you get into books and stuff like that and movie deals, it gets a little, I mean, that's when shit gets to, wild. To me, yeah. the way I frame that is like, you went to Yale. If you're going to talk about like, that's the way that I frame my soft experience is like, this was an education that mattered and kind of built me, but I don't do that anymore. Yeah. So that's kind of the way that I try to get guys to frame it and phrase it. And it's a little weird now because soft, we still softly, we still build programs for soft guys, but like my war stories don't matter to a strength and conditioning program, right? Yeah. Unless it's yeah. directly applicable where it's like, yeah, I picked a guy up doing a thing. Yeah. But if it's not directly applicable to me, that's kind of like where the line is. Totally. So, Absolutely. And everybody has their own line. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So softly, all right. So then you went and did some stuff for a couple of years and you got out of the soft league game for a minute. Yeah. I was just doing contracting. I kind of, I wasn't quite out of it, but I was not in the day to day. Okay. And so, and since you were the founder, was that hard? Did you like, it was, but, but I, you, you maintain your equity. I maintained my equity. I still took a paycheck, okay. a small paycheck. Okay. Um, I was still involved in ideation and bigger things, but I was not in the day to day. And okay. so you know, like I wasn't knee deep in the PNL, uh, like the financials. I wasn't knee deep in. I cleared that for listeners, not you guys. No, you guys know what a PNL. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I was not knee deep in financials. I wasn't knee deep with the coaches. Any of that. I was contracting. I was doing a bunch of stuff with like DOD and you know, kind of whatever I wanted to do, keeping ties to my my like passion, which was you know training and deploying. And then COVID happened, and basically the world was in chaos for a bit and I came back full time into the company um, to try to fix things. So, it, you know, had qu- uh, quite a bit of bad debt. Um, there were just a lot of issues within the company. Massive, like you said, overages on inventory, which by the way, software is great, but also you only get to amortize software over multiple years. So you kind of have the same issue. You go spend a million bucks on building a new app, two million, you amortize that over five years. Damn. So you're still paying real? the man. Yeah. Damn, you can't get out sucks. of taxes. That sucks. That's also my other business to advice to uh, entrepreneurs or business owners is like, never go buy something to circumvent taxes. Yeah. No, like, no, just no. pay the taxes and yeah. put the money in your bank account. Yeah. Don't go buy a new truck unless you need a new, like if you yeah. need a truck, then sure. Go buy a truck. But um, man, yeah. So I, I didn't realize that was, I mean, that's crazy. So yeah. you know, again, for listeners, imagine you had a $2 million expense in your books but you could only write off 400K of that, Yeah. right? Yep. So Uncle Sam maybe says, hey, you actually made 1.6 million on this year. You know, if, just, if you paid for it in cash. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, um, all right, so we're going to tax you 40% of that. So you're going to owe that. Yep. Um, but if you literally lost a couple million that year, you still owe it. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, it's um, it's a yeah. weird shuffle. Yeah. And oh, yeah, there's no shuffles what I've figured out. That's why I say like it's not as complicated as a lot of these guys make it out to be. Um, which can be like to your detriment when you're trying to like game the game, so to speak. And and some of the <clears throat> when you weren't as involved in softly, did you find that was it just you guys just didn't know what you didn't know and you made some mistakes, or had you built a team, or like had you put or had some people filled into positions that they didn't know what they were doing and decisions started to get made that had a trickle effect on the whole organization? Yeah, so that's what it was. Is the, the leadership there didn't work out, didn't have a military soft background, and so the decisions that were made were not good for the company. And mm-hmm. so when I came back, it was like okay. We're not going to become everything to everybody. We're going to stay who we are. And we saw it also was during COVID. And so to our benefit, unfortunately, people couldn't go to gyms in a lot of places. And so 
you know, we so did blew see up. So you guys got a big boom during COVID. It wasn't crazy, but it okay. was good. Like okay. we typically were growing anywhere from a hundred to 30% year on year until that point. And then we kind of stagnated for a year and then we grew again, like 20% or so. Um, so it wasn't crazy, but it wasn't bad. Whereas a lot of people were like, what is going to happen? Is the business going to shut down? Are we going under, et cetera? I'm like, no, like we're, we can do this. So we, we, road mapped our way out and this is where like you just did evan hafer's podcast it's one of the things that i tell everybody who talks about business i'm like dude that guy i'm sure black Ri i know black rifle had its own issues going on at that time business-wise supply chain whatever during covid mm -hmm. that dude was on the phone with me for hours every single day to help me plot and road map how i got that thing turned around softly turned that's around awesome, so and that's one of the things that i tell everybody is like you know Nobody's going to take hours every day or very few men will take hours for two weeks to help you plot your, your course out and roadmap out, like how you're going to fix your business. And, and that was one of the things Evan's done for me in the past. So we, we plotted our course. I hired a CFO that's been a rock star. He's still with us. He was actually our number one customer before becoming CFO. Really? Uh, he serial entrepreneur and He's like, what do you need? And I'm like, I need a strong CFO. And he's like, I can do that. I'm like, well, where's your degree in finance from? He's like, I did a semester of college. I don't have this. And I was like, what? He'd run multiple successful businesses. And we started digging into financials. And he was just so detail-oriented and knew finance so well from having done it in his other endeavors that we like picked our finances apart. And one of the ways that we turned it around, because we had crazy subscriptions for like every tech stack we didn't need and all of this stuff. We identified the critical pieces of infrastructure. We've opened up new accounts and we put those critical pieces of infrastructure for the business on those. And then we shut off every other account and watched for what broke. So we we're like, we had so much going out in like subscriptions and all of these other things. And I was like, dude, we need like a fresh start. And so we figured out like, all right, let's just write out like, what are the worst things that if this turned off, we wouldn't survive. And that's how we did it basically. It, like when things started to break, we turned them back on and flipped them back over. Um, so then, yeah, we needed a new app. And so about a year after that, we started road mapping, like, what does this new app do? And that for the last two and a half years has been the lift is like the next generation of technology, if that makes sense. And what's the um, membership cost per month? Thirty four ninety nine. Okay. Do you know what you're paying to acquire a customer right now? Yeah. Do you want to say it or no? <laughs> Uh, this is like dorky e-commerce stuff, but I, I, I'm a dork. So yeah. Like so, so we're currently, we float between 27 and 40. It's not bad. It's not bad. Okay. It could well, be worse. Do you know what your lifetime value is typically? On I a, do. What is it? It's on that subscription only is yeah. $217. There you go. Those are good numbers, man. They are really good numbers. Yeah. That, I, <laughs> that model works. Throw, throw <laughs> some gas on that fire right now. I may get a phone call time. from somebody that's like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. But, scale, uh, scale, scale. Yeah. So right? that was actually, uh, man, I like, I love talking about business, which is why I was stoked that you're like, no, we like talking about that. I have an uncle that is, uh, he's very eclectic. Like we only talk every couple of years and I schedule that call with him. And when I say he's like, he is a juggernaut in business. Okay. I had the first phone call with him. He asked me those same numbers. That was the only two questions that he asked. I'd like laid out all these problems Smart for guy. like <laughs> 10 minutes of this call. And he's like, what's your customer acquisition cost? And at the time it was like $11. And he's like, okay, when does it, how long does it take you to realize your $11 Except back? And I was like 10 days. Yeah. Well, we do a 10 day free trial. Got it. Okay. And he was like, okay. And how much do you make on that 10th day? I said, $34, 34 dollars 34 99 And he's like, okay, cool. Uh, every penny that you can get, you're going to acquire customers. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, every dollar into that bank account needs to go onto a credit card paying for ads for you to scale that thing as fast as possible. I was like, that's it. He's like, that's it. Call me when that quits working. <laughs> I was like, okay. And that strategy is what took us to be like, we're frankly, I don't know of any other company that is at the size that we are. Um, we also grossly invested in like coaches and education for the coaches and things like that to support the product, mm -hmm. yep. which is like, that's always my number one piece of advice to guys starting a company is like, know your product and invest in your product. And, for us, it's the coaches. So like we have 
phenomenal staff. We have phenomenal contractors and subject matter experts that we call and pay as consultants to build what we build. And if you don't know your product and your product is not the focal point, at some point you slip up and you can't recover from that. So if you have the greatest marketing apparatus in the world and your product sucks, yep. it's never gonna work. Chase your tail. Yep. It, it'll work for a little, yep. but then it doesn't work anymore. Yep. Well, it's all based around lifetime value, right? It if is. you get them in and they, they're happy with the first product or service, they yep. stay in you know the ecosystem and then you don't have to pay to acquire them again. Exactly. And I think that's the, that's the end state. If you can get to the point where you are using your existing customer revenue to run the business, and your yes. break even on um, on on first customer acquired, yeah, um, or making a few bucks like you guys were. I mean, yep. that's a great place to be. Um, and then in theory, um, that base of returning customers just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's how yeah. you, that's how you build up an absolute powerhouse. Yeah, that's the theory behind it. Yeah. <laughs> we all know there's yeah. so many nuts and bolts. It's a big and... it's a big math problem, but yeah, it's, uh, no, that's cool, man. Those are those are great numbers. I think you should you should still be scaling that. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's some. Customer acquisition's gotten really weird with the internet. Like yeah, D2C oh yeah. across the board are, has gotten really hard, which I'm the, sure you the guys The golden know. years are over, man. They are, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was at one point where I remember my then COO called me to chew me out because we had gone from an 18X return on ad spend to like 10X. And he was like, this isn't sustainable at 10X. And now I'm like, I would do unspeakable things oh for 10X God. return on ad spend right Holy now. Shit. You, you just imagine? don't see it in the space. Nope but everybody now is running ads on social. Everybody has a platform and social is engineered to keep you on the platform. I used to like really, I used to enjoy social media because you would post something that was meaningful and engage with friends about their posts that were meaningful. And now social is not engaged. It's not a built for meaningful content. It's built for engaging content, yeah. which is why you see like TikTok dances, my yeah. favorite thing to pick on go viral and have 4 million views. If you, and if we sat here and broke down the world's best strength and conditioning plan and put that on social media and get like 10,000 views, nobody would care. But if you were dancing on TikTok <laughs> with that hair, million <laughs> views right there with the jorts on. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right so I want to hear, I'm going to flip this yeah. thing back at you because yeah. I haven't heard it. So my introduction to born primitive uh, is basically a friend was like, Hey, there's this company born primitive. You guys should work together and collab. And they're like, it's a clothing company. I'm like, like another veteran owned t-shirt company. It's like what I thought, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so they sent me a full sweatsuit and maybe a couple other piece, pieces. And I was like, this is actually really nice. Like I still wear it. I have uh, the hoodies in the car. Oh, nice. Um, I was like, this is actually really nice. I like their stuff. And then shortly after I was introduced to like Mike Herney and some other people that you guys work with. They're like, dude, you got to try our outdoor pants for, you know, like PSE and doing stuff with PSE. It's like, man, it's actually a, to me, it was a different uh, apparel company because usually apparel companies from military guys, it's like, I have an idea for a logo and branding. I'm going to start a business. The differentiator for you guys, not selling, selling your stuff too hard, but was that you seemed product focused where it's like the hoodie was different. I've made hoodies for 15 years now. It wasn't just like an off the shelf hoodie the sweatpants were different. I was like, okay, these guys, if they didn't design it, they at least did a lot of homework and sourcing and all of this to like get to a good product. So you started it before the Navy capital from you and your brother. What was like the next, how would you sum that up? What, what came next? Um, in the early days, it was just the snatch shorts and just screen printed t-shirts. So yeah. yeah, the one over Tony's shoulder was one of the first ones, which is why we got it framed up. I love it. Um, we were just scrappy, man. We went to every CrossFit event basically every weekend we could, packed up the Jeep and um, little by little acquired customers in person, yeah. right? There was, you know, we didn't have, uh, I mean, I, we had social media, I guess, but not really. Yeah. You um, weren't doing a lot of e com back no, then. No, no. Yeah. Um, and then um, we finally realized we wanted to get in kind of the cut and sew performance apparel because I, I realized pretty early on, it's like, all right, anyone, literally anyone could go down to a local screen printing shop and get t shirts made. Like, yeah. literally, there's no barrier to entry. So this is not defendable. Zero. And that's why it got, I, I, I appreciate, or, you know, I respect the success of some of these veteran owned t shirt companies, but from our optic, it's like, there's nothing like literally anyone could create that tomorrow because yeah. because the like the product is a bigger barrier than just like coming up with a logo and going down a screen printing shop and making a bunch Absolutely. of t-shirts right so i i want to be like okay we need to be able to do something that's a more of a differentiator and, and a lot of this came from mal to our co-founder 
so the first product of that was the our sports bra um that like sold out immediately um mal you know nailed the fit and then the you leggings weren't, you weren't the model i was not for that. i was not uh <laughs> and then we launched like the like a board short which is like in crossfit yeah. that was the big fashion yeah, thing yeah. at the time still kind of is but like everyone yeah. wore like board shorts to, to crossfit gyms back then that's old man stuff now by the yeah, way exactly yeah, yeah. Down um, to the knees. but so that was the deal it was like a woodland camo board short with like a tattered yeah. american flag down one leg yeah. uh and you know i thought i was really cool um so that's kind of what got it started and oh this is um this is a you know another level up on screen printed stuff and you know that's kind of what got us going into down that road of cut and sew yeah um and we've continued to do that and i think that's part of the fun you know when we get a bunch of fabric swatches in and we look through them and we you feel it and you look at the you know the um how much it weighs and the the, the characteristics and then we get samples made and then you put it on and you know what i mean it's like we test it that's the fun yeah. part um, if we were just screen printing t-shirts, there's not a whole lot to that, man. Um, so that's, I mean, pretty much every product we, we do, of course, still have our branded stuff that just graphic tees like, yeah, yeah. because people, still there's look. nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But to your point, like, it's just not, it's not that interesting to me or exciting. And there's, it's still running a business is hard no matter what. Yeah. But when you're actually like creating a real product, that's completely unique and different. That's what gets really interesting to me. Yeah. So that, I mean, just little by little, I think. Did you, you know, take on investors or have you guys been fully bootstrapped? Fully you bootstrapped, and your brother man. own the whole yeah. thing now? No yeah. outside. Well, my, my oldest brother, Mike, who's our CFO now, I think yeah. it maybe it was a year after Matt um, bought in as well for, you know, even less than Matt did. Yeah. We'll put it at that. And yeah. it, again, it was just like Sweat the, the brothers, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so. So it's no, family owned. Yeah. We didn't really ever raise money. And, and I think that's something we're proud of. I, I think maybe. Do you guys have debt on the books? You could tell. No, so you'd no, say no, but no, you don't no, get my numbers. No, no, no debt no on the debt. books. No, man. zero. Like not a revolver or no. anything. No, we. So we yeah. have a line of credit. Yeah. But, um. We. You know. We pay don't. It we off. don't really. Yeah. We pay yeah. it off. Pay That's it how down. we are yeah. with Softly. Like we, we, uh, we have inside debt. Like you know, we personally loan money to the company and then pay it back. Yeah. But um. We have a revolver that's like at zero dollars and usually like if we buy a lot of inventory we'll put it on the revolver and then pay it off you know within a month maybe, yeah maybe two um especially when we're developing new apps that's super expensive so you know that screws with your cash flow quite a bit yeah but yeah and i guess technically mal and i use the we use part of the line of credit to buy land down the street um but that's for a building not the, like the oh, business cool. so we're, we're building so you guys it. are building the headquarters yeah big hq man you're gonna funny. have a gym Yes. Is there a gym here? Uh, no, but we have, our, there's we have one, one at our warehouse, warehouse yeah. down the oh, okay, road. Cool. Um, but yeah, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna, gonna have a gym and um, saunas and cold tubs and locker rooms and the whole thing. Nice. Um, so we're, we're pumped about it. That's our I little project. It. Hopefully next summer we'll be rocking. Um, but uh, but you know, one one thing, you know, you, you you know, you had an interesting point about like you screwed up the first business, and I think one thing we learned is that in my first failed business, we we were given, you know, we got money from an investor. We yeah. got 110 grand and. That was my first ever real business. I grew up like mowing lawns. I had like a pretty pretty robust lawn mowing business for you know just a punk yeah. kid. Um, but that was the first real business, and uh, you know we took we got a check. We pitched this this uh, product that we had invented, and uh, what was the product? It was a giant keg koozie. Okay, with, that you could brand, so it would look like a beer can. So That's like, pretty like cool. A giant Miller Lite can, but it was it would wrap the keg. Yeah. Um, we we developed it in college. We did a class on it. Sounds and, and accurate. Yeah, yeah, pretty standard. Yeah. Football right? player at yeah, Yale. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, we thought we thought that was our, our yeah. ticket to, you know, living in Bora Bora. Yeah. But um, but when you have someone else's money, you treat it differently. Right? For sure. Um, so we you know we bought a fifty thousand dollar printer we needed, and I you know I signed like a five year lease on a warehouse and. We took out ads on the chive.com. Like that was our launch day. I thought we were just going to blow it up. You know what I mean? Oh, five grand here, yeah. 10 grand here. Before you know it, all the money's gone. Yeah. Where when you use your own money, and particularly when you're not, you know, like wealthy, I mean, you freaking every penny freaking matters. Man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely does. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that, that mindset has worked really well for us where a lot of our competitors have raised, you know, some of them north of a hundred million dollars. That's nutty. and all of a sudden, you know, they're sponsoring these huge things and they sign all the best athletes. And, and it's like, you know, I, I respect the game. Um, but that, you know, a lot of that's backfiring now, man. Yeah. Um, because guess what? Now you're the founder, you have no control of your own company. You got a bunch of dudes in suits in a conference room, a lot like this, telling you what to do. Or, right, like you mentioned off air that we, which we won't mention, people almost getting kicked out of their own company that they freaking started. Yep. Um, I mean, that happened with Chip Wilson, um, with Lululemon. Yeah. Right. He, he made a major private equity mistake and then he started, you know, well, the, the brand started losing its identity. Yeah. 
and getting more in one direction. And he's saying, whoa, whoa, I'm the founder. That's not how we roll. Right. Um, and guess they what? Said, actually, Chip. What? Yeah, I said, they said, actually, actually Chip, Chip. We, you now work for us. Yeah. See you later. And no yeah. more Chip. Dude freaking started Lululemon. Yeah. Right? So um, I'm proud that we still call the shots. Um, sure. We still are true to who we are. We're not afraid of who we are. You see the American flag on the wall right behind you with the 50 cal rounds and yeah. where the stars are. Yeah. Um, it's very, you know, uh, we're proud of that. And now eventually there's going to be a time where we can take on an investor. I think that'll be in a couple of years, but we now know, you know, we want to make sure we align with the right partner that will yeah. allow us to maintain the integrity of the brand. Yeah. Yeah. So That's smart. I, yeah. I talked about this a lot with Evan on his podcast that, you know, both of us just did, but, uh, I did it the week after you did. Yeah. The, I was never a process guy. Like when guys are like, oh yeah, I'm all about the process. That was never me. I'm like, I don't give a shit what the process is. Like I want the light at the end of the tunnel previously. And now I fully love the process of it. So a lot of those mistakes, I'm like, man, I, was it a mistake? I don't know. Cause now I've learned the lesson. And that's been one of my thoughts with the failed companies because I've had a couple other failed companies as well prior to the main USA clothing line. <laughs> Damn, dude. Um, yeah. All these not, skeletons are coming out. No, they're I love not it. really I love it. It, like mean, it means big you're failures. To play it was like, okay, well, I'm going to try this, but like I hit the ceiling or whatever it was and didn't miss, I don't think I lost money on any of those, but um, the lessons learned were ingrained so much more than the lessons learned when it went well if that makes sense. So for me, a lot of times I'm like, well, I, I like went ugly early. I gave away equity like it was candy. I took in, you know, took on debt. We took on, I uh, can't name the company that we took the debt on from in the early days of Softleet to pay for ads, but it was like 25% APR type loans, like crazy. But we were like, whatever, like our numbers, we can support this until you can't and things change. And that's what happened was the landscape changed. And so my point is I've come to love that process of learning so much, which is funny because I hated school, but I love learning through business so much that I don't view those necessarily as mistakes at this point. Um, I'm kind of like glad they happened to like get them out of the way, right? Like get that done in the twenties that way in your thirties, forties, et cetera, you can, you know, hit the ground running. So to speak. Did, did you find that that <clears throat> did that ground your decision making a little bit too, when you kind of flipped it and started to enjoy the process more? And I asked that because I think when you're so worried about the end state, and this is applicable to business and life, you yeah. get the shiny object syndrome where you're so set on that end state that you're chasing your tail all over the place, trying to bring that end state forward. Whereas when you fall in love with the process, you show up each day, there's like a calmer, less neurotic version of you that then makes decisions better. And that, that's my own bias. But do you feel like you yeah. felt that a so little bit? So I would say that I am, I feel better about going through that, the hard times, let's call it. I'm less stressed about that, knowing that that's part of the process. Yeah. I don't feel that we were neurotic in the early days of like chasing our tail. I've seen a lot of people do that. I actually just told a friend of mine who's doing advertising for a very large company now and kind of not struggling to get results, but struggling with the process. And I was like, dude, just calm down, like build your strategy and run your strategy, right? Like plan your dive, dive your plan. Mm -hmm. That's the thing for you guys. Yep. And that's what you do is you build your strategy and you run your strategy. And if you fail, it sucks. You might get fired. You might lose your company, whatever it is, but now you have all of this. Whereas if you build your plan and change your plan halfway through, you have no idea if it was going to work or not. And so for me now, I'm not so much, I don't think we were neurotic previously, mm -hmm. but the stress was so hard because all I thought about was we're here and we're getting to here. And now I'm like, we're here and the next step is here and we're doing this. And I know in the back of my head that way down here, that's the outcome. But part of it too is being in a leadership role in like two companies right now with other people is you're bringing other people through that process. Whereas those people, if you didn't bring them through that process, they're not gonna understand how we got to the thing at the yep. very end. And so that's one of the really exciting things for me is like you're teaching other people as you learn, you're kind of like doing it all together, if that makes sense. And they're learning the way as you learn the way. Um, and that's what's started to make it and that's a, less that's, frantic. <clears throat> that's a sustainable team because it's so easy Very. too to do closed doors where you're making all the decisions with only the high ups and you're right, you yep. pull forward that end result, but then you don't have a team that can manage it. So. I love that because yeah. like there's the importance of building a sustainable team is when you teach them day to day. And that's that's a grind too, especially like pulling forward their knowledge. You build a system then 
where you can take a step back and you're like, holy shit, like, look at this now. Everyone can do it because you pulled them through that as opposed to like, oh, we're going to make this happen in a closed room. Yeah. And then they'll just execute. It's like, well, yeah, they won't be able to execute that in that plan. No, they can't. Yeah. And there, there's definitely a time like you guys have seen it where you're in the trenches and you're like, like, I'll still get on to, you know, both of the companies that I work for. I'll still get on and make website changes or answer customer service on Christmas or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 10 o'clock at night and something's built burning down. Like I'm up knocking it out, quote unquote, in the trenches, if you will, as people like to say, but just, you know, sleeves rolled up and there's definitely a time and place for that. But when you can do things properly, that is so much more important than it's really easy, especially as an entrepreneur to be like, get out of the way. I'm going to do this because you've done those like nitty gritty things before. Like, I don't know if you built your first website or if you paid somebody to do it, but it's really easy just to be like, ah, I'll just handle this and get it. Whether that's like a photo shoot, product design, whatever it is. But once you have that team built, it is so much better long-term for everybody. If you'd be like, no, 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 no. I'll help. Like I'll help with this. I'll guide you through it. We'll work on this thing together, but you're not going to just like push them to the side to get it done. For sure. And usually like they're in that seat because they're probably better at that thing than you anyway. <laughs> oh, totally. so, <laughs> oh, that's, that's yeah. me, man. That's yep. oh, that's so spot on. That's what it was funny when I'll I was trying to sneak do back that. into the creative department be like, Hey, uh, can we, can we, can we increase the spawn a little they're bit? They're giving you the head nod. Get like, the fuck out of here. Yeah, Let us exactly. do our job. I'm like, yeah, you guys, you guys are way better than me. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's good. You have, there's so many guys that I see, like I always laugh cause it's like, I'll go and I'm like, Hey, what about like, Sometimes it's a good idea, but I, I'm very aware of when it's not. And you get that look, you know, like they're like, hey, get yeah, out of here. Yeah. You know, it's and a lot of people don't have that um, self-awareness to yeah. be like, yeah, I just said something dumb. All right, I'm going to leave now. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the next ridge line for Softly? Uh, so we have a new app coming out. So okay. we hired, a, well, we've worked with uh, Dr. Kate Page. She's a doctor of neurophysiology. Yeah, she's We're, coming on. Yeah, she's coming on. Yeah, she's coming awesome. on. We were supposed uh, to have her last yeah, week. Yeah, she, she had to cancel. I think she got sick. Um, April fifth. She's coming on April fifth. Yeah. yeah, she faked it. She I, wasn't, I, yeah. she's I met over. her. I met her out in uh, Utah. We did this like retreat thing. Cool. Um, yeah, she's awesome. She wrote articles for us in the early days. Worked with us on projects here and there. We brought her in as a as as a contractor, but part of the staff while we were developing an algorithm to take your stress levels via wearable data cool, and then change your training plans day to day according. So really cool. in our community, most of the world has the issue that they need the, we'll call it the David Goggins approach. Like you need to go harder and, you know, quit cutting out when it's easy. I would say that works for most of the world, but for our clientele, you see way more seals, like, high level police officers, MARSOC guys, regular, you know, or infantry military guys pushing harder than they should. Like, oh, I only got three hours of sleep, still going to max out on bench press today. And so what we basically wanted to do is take all of your stress that we could measure for the masses. And it's not a perfect solution, but it's a really good solution. And then change your training accordingly. And then the other piece is it waits out the stressors that we're putting on you through physical events and then changes your relationship in the algorithm to those stressors, if that makes sense. So if you're really efficient at a back squat, let's say, and I'm very inefficient, that'll affect you less than it does me, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So you may be still better primed on less sleep than I am for that movement. It's really wise. I think that the whole to hear you guys doing that, like, because I'm a nerd on this stuff too. Like the industry now, you're right in saying, with high performers, the industry is going to go more that way. And you see it with like things like yep. aura scores and HR, HRV, yes. resting heart rate, yep. because that's what I saw in myself. And then with high level athletes is the exact opposite. They don't need David Goggins telling them to no. run more. They need to understand that there's different pillars that contribute to you being a grounded, like calm, performing at your best. And yep. weight working out is only one of those, say, six pillars. And the other yeah. are rest, sleep, diet. And if you... People love to use that as, and you, cause you get that little, I think you get a dopamine hit too. Like you finish you do, that absolutely. workout, but yeah. then, but then when you, when you're looking at the downstream effects of that, I call it the burnt toast effect. Like you're burning out your system from the inside out and that you will pay that debt eventually, you know, whether it's an injury or even like your mental, emotional state, like you're going to be, your cortisol levels are going to be high. So yep. to hear you guys doing that, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. So stress is total and cumulative in that your mental, emotional stress from your daughter having an ear infection and you're up all night with her and you're stressed because now like that's your, that's your daughter. And so you're stressed about her. 
that has an effect that on the body is very similar to a one rep max deadlift or, or whatever the exactly. physical stressor is. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually see all of that in your wearable data. And there was a, there is still, you know, prior to our app publicly launching, there's a massive gap between, well, like I love my Garmin, but all it tells me is like, you're not really primed to train today. It doesn't give me any quantifiable data. Yep. It doesn't yep. say, you know, do A, B, and C. It says do less or you're good, do more. And so our approach was actually give the guys the less or more that they're supposed to do. That way they're not, you know, in our community, they're still going to overtrain or be like, ah, oh, screw it. it. says I'm not primed to train. They get that pre-workout yeah. in them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just drink time drink a monster, yeah. throw in a dip. Be like, let's do this. Yeah, right. exactly. That's what the guys do yeah. half yeah. the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's the next horizon for softly. Uh, and then also I don't talk about it a ton on these podcasts usually, but I work at PSE as an yeah. executive. As just, just a casual <laughs> chief marketing officer. Just, just, you know, no big uh, deal. It's, yeah. it's an awesome company. It's 50 year old American manufacturing company in the outdoor space. I was super passionate about archery for a long time. Took a couple of years off in, um, from about 2019 to 2022, wasn't shooting a ton. Um, and then had the opportunity to work with PSE and like dove back into it. And, um, that's been super exciting. So that's also like, for me, that's one of the big horizons is like, how far can we take, you know, PSE, 50 yeah. year old archery company. And speaking of that, you know, cause yeah. PSE and born primitive outdoor have been working together on some stuff. Yep. Um, Kurt, our director uh, for operations for outdoor um, slacked me the, are you tracking the giveaway we're doing? I am. So, so I'm going to plug it. All right, yeah, here we plug go. It. All right. We got a giveaway going on. Uh, it will end April 15th. So this should be aired before then, or we'll make it air before then. We'll figure it out. <laughs> um, but if you go to born primitive outdoors, Instagram page, we're doing a pretty big giveaway. So from BP, BP outdoor, you're going to get a full loadout of our, of our full outdoor line, which I think is well over a thousand dollars. Oh, it's um, like a couple grand. It's a uh, four grand now. Uh, yeah. four, uh, and then uh PSC is given a, um, the DS carbon fiber bow. Yeah. The Mach 30 DS carbon right. fiber bow. The Mach 30. There and it it's is. it's color matched to all the gear. Oh, Ooh, cool. Yeah. Nice. Right on. Looks sick. And what, what's the retail on a bow like that? 1900 bucks. Shoot. Okay, yeah. cool. All right. So you're going to get a $2,000 bow. Uh, Kafaro is going to be throwing in one of their carbon fiber frame uh, with pack. And then Jack Lynx um, is going to be throwing in a $1,000 gift card for beef jerky. Yeah. So if that sounds intriguing to you, head to the, the Instagram page for Born Proof Outdoor and go to our, our link in bio and you, you'll just click on it. It'll take you to the landing page. You just got to put your name, phone number, and email in there and that's it. Yep. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty sweet giveaway. Yeah, it's sick. We did a color match bow to, I think, your guys' gear and the Kafaru pack is like all Perfect. color matched. Yeah. It looks and, sick. And I, you guys, I think, sent us a couple bows, didn't you? We for, did. They're, they're trying to get me into the hunting game, yeah. so I got I to gotta get on that, man. Well, the guys yeah. hit me up and they were... <laughs> They were like, hey, we want uh, these bows. They want a longer axle-to-axle -axle bow because you guys are jumping with them, yeah. is my understanding. Yes. And I was like, no, 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 they don't want that. They want the 30-inch shorter bow because it's going to be more aerodynamic. Yeah. You don't want an extra six inches hanging okay. off of you. And I guess uh, somebody came back and was like, why? Like, who's this guy telling us we want a 30-inch bow? And I was like, hey, I've, I've, I haven't jumped a bow. Got but it. like, yeah. I've flown through the air too, man. Yeah. You know? No, no, I got like, you. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. It's kind of a weird background to have in an archery company, but so our guys were laughing. Yeah. That was a, probably an odd request of wait, they're skydiving these bows. That's sweet. That's well, weird, it was yeah. to everybody, but me, yeah. I, actually, I actually have a good friend who he did it with a rifle, but he found a, a locked piece of public land. So it was all private and okay. he's a skydiving instructor okay. and big going. hunter. Yeah. And he was like, I'm doing the thing. Everybody's always thought about and talking about. He's, jumped in, shot a pronghorn, and then had a helicopter extract. Damn it. So it has been done. It has been done. Damn it. Yeah. Okay. And it's a friend of mine. He, you got to have him on the podcast. Is this, um, his oh. name's Carlos. Okay. I thought it was like, remember the, the seal we met at Western hunt. That was a, uh, Hawaii guy that like, uh, does, he does, um, outfitting in Alaska, but that's, that's, you probably know him too. I forget yeah. what his name. Oh, Trevor? 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 Trevor Thompson? Trevor's I, a good friend of mine. I thought you were talking no, about Trevor. I don't, okay. I wouldn't surprise me if Trevor did that or has done yeah. I did a hunt this last year with Trevor. Did okay. That's, with Trevor. that's who I thought you were. No. Right. So this guy, he's like the most interesting guy on the planet. He was a recon corpsman, invasion of Iraq, got out, became a Green Beret, finished that. I think he's an MD medical doctor. He's also a black belt in jujitsu and a falconer and, and a hunting guide. I'm like, is there anything you haven't Jeez, done? Hell yeah. That's busy. Yeah. Super Damn. busy. He just finished, I think his second PhD recently, Jesus. but, 
but uh yeah he he did that thing maybe like two years ago that's like, pretty sweet so we'll, put some bad cell phone pictures on his own facebook that, like, was, that it. was it yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're well, so what we're doing is out in october this year out in utah um, we went out to Western Hunt Expo and yep. they do the big like charity fundraiser gala thing. Yeah. So we got an item in the auction that like, you know, we're covering a uh, born print of outdoor it is. And we're, we took two donors that, that bid on it and we're skydiving them into an elk hunt. Um, That's awesome. It's on a ranch, you know, in, in Utah, but it's not like, I mean, it's like thousands of acres. It's yeah. not like this, like fence. It's not in. high fence. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just it's private. Just, um, and uh, yeah, we, we, it, we went for 170 grand. Um, That's so we're going to donate all the, uh, all the profits to wildlife conservation and veteran charities. Awesome. Uh, so it gave us the opportunity to raise a bunch of money for charity. It's a ton of money. The donors are absolutely stoked. I'm um, obviously, yeah. these are people that come from a pretty affluent background yeah. to be able to pay. Are they uh, tandeming in? Yeah. So okay. we're, we're going to tandem them in. Yeah. Um, and bows. Y- yep. And it will, it, they'll get the choice of bow or rifle. Yeah. Um, but either way we'll, we'll, we'll jump the equipment in yeah. and then, um, we'll do the hunt. Aaron Snyder is going to guide it. Cool. Um, and then we're going to pull. Is he up. jumping? Yeah, we're gonna tandem him in as well. So everybody's jumping in. Everybody's jumping in. And yeah. is it? I'm sorry, I'm yeah. cutting you off while yeah, you good. explain. But is that because this is fascinating to me? Are they like they've got to hike out when they land, or is it a situation where like you could drive in if you had to to like extract? Y- you can drive in. Okay. Yeah. In yeah. in the 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 point here is we want to do this every year as a way to like raise money for charity, no, kind of make it our, cool. our one thing. And, and I know, don't mean yeah. that that takes away. No, no, no. But I was gonna tell you you're crazy if you're taking like an unknown random, person yeah. that's yeah. random or you're like you have no idea how fit they are. Well, that was the original like, plan. Uh, um, but then we were <laughs> like, well, let's plan. do this. We were gonna do the landlock. That was yeah. actually the original. So, so, plan. But the goal is this is our for for us internally. This is a proof of concept, so we can actually execute this as a company for real in real oh, cool. life. Right. Yeah. So we would jump the rucks in the whole thing and you land and you're on your own. Like yeah. there's no medical personnel on the ground, yeah. no ambulance and all that shit. So this one will be a bit more controlled because obviously these are people are paying a lot of money. Yeah. So we'll have, um, you know, we'll have the wind, you know, readings on the ground and all that Smart. shit. Right. And yeah. have a, like, you know, a corpsman there, you know, whatever, yep. just to make sure I can't have a donor break their leg on landing, even though they yeah. won't, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but then, uh, yeah. And then we have the, the diesel brothers donated their, their they bought a 60, like a blacked out 60. Okay. Um, and they're going to come pick us up um, once we get once a bull. Um, so they're going to pull us out of the field. And then Bruno, who was a, a night stalker, he's our director of operations for tactical. Yeah. He's going to be one of the pilots. Super cool. Which is going to be awesome for yeah. him. Um, you know, those guys are the best in the world. Does so. he still fly a lot? Uh, no, but the, but the, <laughs> the diesel brothers said, yeah, we'll take, I mean, he's a one sixtieth guy. Yeah. So like the best in the game. So it yeah. should be a fun thing for the company. And that's um, awesome. And they get to bring their families out to the ranch and hang out with them while like mom or dad does the hunt. Um, you know, we'll, t- well, we're going to entertain their family and take them shooting and like rip ATVs and Super just cool. do a bunch of dude stuff. Yeah. Take them fishing and all that stuff. Um, and so it'll be a really cool thing, but yeah, that's, nice. that's what it is. And hopefully then it'll maybe pave the way for doing, you know, a real jump into like Alaska or something and see if yeah. we can hack it. I mean, that'd be pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, now you have to lay up for a day because you can't technically spot from the air. Um, oh. so you gotta wait 24 hours, to which move. is, it's ridiculous. Obviously if you're jumping for 13,000 feet, you're not spotting. What if you don't spot? we're not it's spotting a, a but i think just to like make sure that You're they good. don't come after us yeah. we're just gonna lay up for i the think day. you just are blindfolded until you exit. yeah well <laughs> and it's like all right if you're looking off of a ramp at thirteen thousand feet like yeah. uh, you cannot see freaking anything at, uh, at least. so it's like it's a little ridiculous yeah i mean i could maybe if it was a static line at 1500 feet like you probably that's you, more ridiculous. you can definitely see yeah. um you know some stuff but uh anyway so that's what we're gonna do and it, it'll be pretty fun so yeah. we'll see it's one of those, like, it's been talked about in, like, soft guys who hunt. That gets brought up <laughs> every time you're around Couple each other. Here I, yeah. I was, here I thought I had this epic original idea. It's, it's like, epic, no, everyone's talking about just not original. <laughs> uh, but it's cool to hear, like, people actually doing it. Like, that's that stuff excites me so much when it's like, that's epic. Also insane, and I love that you're actually doing it. Yeah. And it's even dumber that you're taking donors instead of like <laughs> a whole seal team. <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. Oh, the, the one lady, she's from Park City. She won it. I mean, she was like, Is she like sad. training for it. Uh, I have no idea. I, I think she just nope. wants to come to the ranch and like in in, in drink yeah. wine and hang out. Oh yeah. Uh, but so uh, she's gonna like jump and then hang at the ranch. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's hilarious. She, she paid enough. She can do whatever she wants yeah. at this point. Yeah. So. Um, cool. well shit, man, any, any closing thoughts? Like, let's plug, obviously, um, how can people sign up? I mean, I'm sure they just yeah, search softly. the app. Yeah, softly.com, okay. softly HQ is our social, um, PSE bows is PSE's social, PSE archery.com. Um, that's it. That's the plugs. 
Okay. So, I'm so bad at the sales side. No, I mean, hey, we, we don't really roll like that either. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, okay. Any, any other cl- uh, closing thoughts? No, thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. It's great meeting you guys. Heck yeah. Tony, yeah. what do you got? Hey, we're good. I like this one. Awesome. Well, thanks, Brent. Appreciate it. I know we went in a lot of different directions on yeah. that, but a good mix of, you know, I think the entrepreneurial stuff is really, um, is really fascinating and it's cool to see other people that have chose similar paths. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the common thread I've seen is, um, you know, the, the, the best lessons learned are the ones you just kind of have to learn the hard way. Right. And that's yeah. why I think when you, when you get a mentor, that's 20 years ahead of you and they're giving you advice and, and maybe you're wondering right, what, why does this guy or girl think that like most of the, that knowledge is rooted in a lot of mistakes made. So yeah. pay it some respect, not to say you're, they're always going to know more than you, um, they usually but, do. <laughs> but they usually do because they probably made that mistake 20 years ago and they, you know, they see things you can't even see yet that are, that are potential yeah. uh, blind spots or landmines that you could step on. So yep. find a mentor, um, particularly if you're launching a business, um, put yourself out there and try to, you know, have someone guide you along the way. Um, and, uh, I think most people, once they get into a position of success, um, you know, we do want to pay it back, you know, pay it forward because we got a Absolutely. lot of similar advice. So don't be afraid to, you know, ask to get a cup of coffee with someone and bend their ear for 30 minutes and, um, you know, let them, you know, allow you to avoid some of those pitfalls that they did. Yeah, Cause absolutely. I know I, I, I like to, you know, and listen to it maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't be too stubborn and think, you know, better because yeah. you probably don't. No. Um, but, uh, well, awesome. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Hope everybody has a, a good week and, uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks guys. 